Jim and Jamie Dutcher, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having us, Brett. Yeah, thank you very much. So you two recently published a book, The Wisdom of Wolves, and this is based on a project you all did back in the 90s. You filmed from 1991 to 1996, a pack of wolves, and it's called the Sawtooth Pack. Let's start for the background of that. Like, What was the impetus behind the project of filming a pack of wolves for such a long time, too? Well, I've been a filmmaker that specializes in animals that you just don't get to see in the wild. Mountain lions, beavers, undersea subjects. And um, after finishing a successful film on mountain lions, we put together a proposal with ABC television to do a special on wolves. And But you just can't go out and find a pack of wolves and uh, film them in a meaningful way. I mean, you can, but they're so far away, they're so intelligent that they change their behavior and run away. We wanted to be able to get into their lives, into their social lives. So we set this project up with puppies, bottle feed them from the moment they opened their eyes and camped with them for six years afterwards. But uh, we gained their trust by being with them from the moment they realized they were here on this planet. <laughs> and where did you all get the wolf pups from, the, the initial wolf pups? Well, there was a woman up in Montana that, that inherited or had to just took over a pack of wolves that was they were being experimented with. And, and they were in Alaska. And she, she said, if you give me the pack, I'll, I'll take care of them. Please don't euthanize them. Uh, they were, the project was finished and they were going to put them all to sleep. So she had also seen the mountain lion film and thought we could do a, a lot of good for wolves if she gave us puppies. So we started the sawtooth pack with a pack of puppies. Four of them. And so, you know, wolves are, they're, they're, well, we'll talk about this later on, but they're, they explore, right? And their territories can be large and they'll move from territory to territory. How did you keep them contained within a certain area so you could film them? Well, we had, uh, they were an enclosed situation and we actually had the largest wolf enclosure in the world. It was 25 acres. And it's important to note that, you know, all behavior studies that have been done on wolves have to be done in captivity because you can't get close enough to them. But most of these studies have been in very small enclosures of one to three acres. So, you know, we had the largest enclosure in the world, 25 acres. And this, you know, it's true that wolves do have huge territories, but since the the uh, the pack basically grew up in this area, they were pretty. They were very content. They didn't uh, they didn't pace the fence. You could lose a wolf for days in this area. We had a, a very mixed terrain. We were at the foot of the Sawtooth Mountains. We had alpine meadow. We had forest. We had streams. It was quite varied, and they they were very comfortable in that location because, of course, their family was there. So, you know, as you just mentioned, you know, a lot of previous studies on wolves were done on captive wolves and in a really small area. How did those studies maybe mislead us about, you know, what are some of the things that we maybe got wrong about wolves by studying captive wolves and, and putting them in such a, a small area? Well, I, you know, I don't want to speak for, for every study, but I, I know that there's some researchers that would enter enclosures and would, would dominate the wolves or, you know, uh, and by, by doing that, by making the wolves submit, you've changed their behavior. You know, you've, you've just altered things going on. And I think also being in a, in a smaller situation can lead towards um, maybe some unnecessary aggression. We, we made sure that, you know, even though we bottle fed these wolves from pups, just as if they were opening their eyes. So they would trust us. We never treated them as pets. We never, and we never tried to dominate or be submissive to them. We were very, very neutral. And I think that allowed us access to this intimate behavior without really affecting the way they lived their lives. You know, we would have our, our film gear and our sound gear, and we would be out with the pack and, you know, they just, we wouldn't miss a beat because we were basically like the furniture. They wouldn't just stop and go, oh, who's here? You know, so I, I think it also having this this larger area gave us an opportunity to really see these wolves' lives 
unfold for us. And, you know, they revealed to us how compassionate and caring they are for one another. And, you know, even though, you know, the great apes are, are more closely related to us DNA wise, dogs, I mean, and, you know, wolves are also, you know, descendants of, of created the dog. Wolves social behavior is really so much like our own. You know, you can watch wolves and you can you can see, you know, your colleagues at work. You could see uh, kids on the school playground. It, it was a really wonderful way to uh, to observe them and learn a lot more. Well, one other reason for approaching this project the way we did and with captive wolves. If you go out into the wild and you habituate a pack of wolves and gain their trust, um, wolves are hunted in the three western states um, where they mostly live, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. And if you gain the wolf's trust, then maybe the next time a wolf sees someone, it may not be a camera being pointed at them. It'll be a gun. And so we didn't want that to happen. So we, this that was the reason we approached the project the way we did. Okay. So, uh, you know, um, Jamie, you just talked about the social life of wolves. Wolves are famous for their social hierarchies, right? There's an alpha yes. wolf, yeah. a beta wolf. But let, let's, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about how wolf hierarchies work. What do you think are, I mean, what do you all think are the main misconceptions about wolf social hierarchies that people might have? Well, I, th- I think one of the biggest misconceptions is, is the term alpha. And alpha seems to be falling out of favor with a lot of people, but we still use it to describe, you know, the, the leader of the pack. The alpha is uh, is generally the the father of the pack. The alpha male and female are, are the parents of the pack generally, and so they would be, you know, the the parents in your own family, and they're the ones that really determine how the day to day operations of the family works. And I think a lot of people have this idea: oh, the alpha must be this, you know, tough, strong, aggressive. You know, we use it in a very negative way nowadays. We're really the alpha. Our alpha was a very benevolent leader. He led with kindness. He was a very caring leader and and father of the pack. And it it really showed us that there's more to being an alpha than just strength. That really they they take care of the family. They uh, they decide who's going to eat first and last. It's um it's a very sensitive caring thing. Uh, another interesting point that they've been discovering actually in Yellowstone since the wolf reintroduction is that, you know, it was always thought that uh, you know, it must be the alpha male that leads the pack. There have been sightings where people have been watching the wolves and the alpha male will get up and stretch and get ready to go somewhere and the rest of the pack doesn't pay attention. But if the alpha female gets up, everyone stands to attention. They want. They know something's going on. <laughs> they, they we're want going to, someplace. Yeah, we're going someplace. We need to be ready. So, um, you know, the the female has a lot to do with it as well. So, I think that's the ma- one of the major misconceptions is that this alpha is this tough, you know, lead with an iron fist kind of leader, and and it, it really isn't that way. I mean, you know, wolves are all they're individuals, and all families are different, but generally they they don't need to lead with a, an iron fist. Brett, another misconception is that the pack, that it's just this mob that got together in the forest and went out to make a killing. It really isn't. It's it's a family. It's mother, father, aunts and uncles, grandchildren, grandparents. They may adopt another wolf. Another wolf could join them. Sometimes not. Some, But um, mo- mo- by and large, it's a family. Yeah, I think that's I, – I, I learned that just recently. I thought, you know, wolves just got together and they sort of – you know, fought it out to see who was the alpha wolf, and then that was it. But no, it's like it's a family, and it's the the mom and the dad. <laughs> they're yeah, the, they're yeah. the leaders. Boy meets girl, and uh, you know they they have a family, and then a girl goes from there. <laughs> Another misconception is the lone wolf. Uh, that's a disperser. That's a wolf that wants to go out and find another wolf. It's a very temporary situation. They, they perhaps the wolf sort of outgrew the family it was in, had aspirations of being the leader, and yet there was a strong leader. So he or she goes off and looks for a mate, another disperser, and they form another pack. But they have to do this pretty quickly because it's very difficult for a wolf in the winter time to feed itself because. Um, the, the the smaller animals are under the snow and you know hibernating, but elk and the deer and the uh, animals that they feed upon, you need teamwork to bring.
bring them down. Yeah. And this misconception of, you know, people saying, oh, you know, I'm a lone wolf. I don't need anybody. Well, you know, wolves need each other. They need to they need a family and they need to belong. So it's a very temporary situation in which a wolf doesn't want to be in for a very long time. Right. So there's some wisdom right there we can get right there just on leadership. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So I think you mm-hmm. know, if we all look at the, the leaders that inspired us the most, they weren't domineering, they weren't aggressive, they weren't loud, I and mean, they could be if they needed to be, but mostly they were just calmly leading the leading the group. And sure, yeah, lead with kindness, right? Yeah. And then with the lone wolf thing, like we, you know, in order for humans to survive and thrive, like we need each other as well. We need a group. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we talked about alpha wolves. There are omega wolves. So they're sort of like the low, like the the low man on the totem pole. But despite that, the way you describe the omega in this pack, like he, the wolves treated him, you know, with you know they they kind of bullied him sometimes, but they also saw that he had a role as well. So what is the role of an omega wolf in a, a wolf pack? Well, in in our pack, the omegas seem to be the instigators of play, using play to diffuse pack tension. And, you know, they could always, you know, get get the rest of the wolves in a lighthearted mood, you know, for a great game of tag. But, you know, like you had mentioned, they're, they are also the focus of of pack aggression. They're the, the low man or woman on the totem pole, and uh, they do get picked on. They they generally are forced to eat last. They have to wait till everyone else is finished. But they really have an important role to play within the pack. For instance, when we were just talking about dispersing wolves, an omega wolf has a has a definite position. So uh, the omega wouldn't be a wouldn't generally be a disperser. His he you know he's got a, a really definite spot in the pack and and knows what that spot is. But all the same, you know the wolves still really cared for him and. In our pack, there was a point where the Omega seemed to be allowed to retire from the position and the other rest of the wolves stopped picking on him. And unfortunately, they found another one to pick on a little bit. And what was really great is that Lakota, the Omega, the old Omega, never picked on this new Omega. It's like he knew where, you know, he he knew what had happened and and just wasn't going to, to pitch in on that. But one really touching story with the Omega had to do with another wolf in the pack, which is the beta wolf who, or second in command generally. And we started noticing when we would slow down our film and watch it in slow motion, that Motsi, the beta wolf, would, if there were, there was a dispute going on with the Omega, he would actually run into the fray of the wolves and the dispute going on and break it up. So the Omega could get away. And after watching this more and more, we started to notice that the two of them hung out together. They would sleep together. The beta wolf would would let the omega wolf jump on his back, which another wolf would never let happen. And they really had an incredible friendship. And this, this beta wolf just, the only way you could say it is really took him under his wing and just made things didn't, made sure things didn't get out of hand, which was quite sweet. And the, and the way that we should be taking care of our weaker members of our family and community. And how are Omegas determined? Is it just personality? They're just timid? And how does that shake out? Yeah, generally it seems to be their personality. Lakota was a very shy wolf, although interestingly he was bigger than the alpha. The alpha was actually his brother, but he was bigger than the alpha wolf. So it seems more to do with uh, with personality than it than it does just, you know, physical weakness. So going back to this idea of wolves and family being so important, one of the one of the things I liked that, I, that really was touching, right, was how much all the wolves were invested in the pups of a pack and not just the parents. Like, what did the other adult wolves do to help rear these uh, wolf pups? Well, and we, as I said, we started with puppies, but we had other pups given to us as the years went on until finally our alpha pair, she, she uh, dug a den and we had puppies of our own. But all along the way, you could see these unrelated wolves caring for pups. And um, we would keep them separate for a while, so just so we could bond with them and nurture them and feed them. Um, uh, we've used milk bottles and round the clock. And, and as it got older, we would play with them a lot, just being with them. So they were fenced off. And the other wolves would sometimes bring presents, 
and slip them through the chain link fence for the younger wolves. I, I always thought that was so sweet. Little pieces of hide and bone. It was pretty, pretty yeah, cute. Yeah. But it, it's, it's really kind of, it's all, all the members of the pack take care of the pups. You know, they're, they're born to the, generally born to the alpha pair, but you'll have one wolf that will step up to be the puppy sitter. You'll have others that will help become teachers. And then there, there are others that are just generally playmates and nothing more than, than clowns for the, the, the pups. But they all, uh, it's really interesting how, you know, wolves just love pups, whether, whether related or unrelated, they really take care of them. Yeah. I think you made the point that biologists have noted in wolves, when pups are born into a pack, the, the non-parent adult wolves kind of enter another, like a second pup phase and then become yes, very some playful. Of the yearlings. Right. right. And, uh, it, to me, it reminded me of just like, you know, goofy uncles. Like that's like the job of like a human uncle, right? That's like, you're there to like <laughs> yeah. play with the, your nieces and nephews, do the things that your parents, like the kid's parents would be like, no, don't do that. It's not safe. Like, no, aunts and uncles there are like, no, we're going to do some crazy stuff. I got to teach you how to, to have fun. Oh, yeah, ab- yeah. absolutely. And we we absolutely had had the goofy uncle. One of the mid-ranking wolves, Amani, was totally a complete clown. And, and he just, he had no interest in teaching the pups or nurturing them. He just wanted to play. And they loved him. So in our book, we have other stories of other wolves we have come to know. And uh, one of them is from the wolf watchers out in Yellowstone watching a similar type of wolf, a, a goofy uncle that went off on its own, look, probably looking for gophers and uh, ground squirrels and such, and must have come upon the carcass of a huge bison and thought, I don't know, whatever he thought, <laughs> he picked up the, the skull, the monstrous skull, and carted it back, which would have probably been 10 or 15 minutes back to the rendezvous spot where the pups were, his um, his younger brothers and sisters, and he gave that to them. Yeah, it and took it, him hours to it get it. It took him <laughs> hours to do this, and he had to put it down and lift it up, and it was just, but why he did that, he and he just seemed to care about the younger pups. No, I love that. I, that was some of my, my favorite stories from the book. Well, you know, speaking of play, like, yeah, you highlight in the book that wolves they, they play all the time. I mean, so what role, I mean, why do they play? Do, do biologists know like why wolves play so much? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's not so different than, uh, than humans really. I mean, you know, we all play and we play to hone uh, different skills. I mean, you know, for, for wolves, you know, play helps them that reinforce their bonds with each other, but it also helps teach them, you know, uh, hunting techniques, stalking, you know, just all kinds of different skills, testing where they're, where they're strong and where they might be a little, little, uh, little weak. And, and so it, it play is a, is a vital part of, learning and and becoming a stronger wolf but also for the sheer joy of it you know we you know wolves can be seen on sides of mountains just running like crazy and chasing each other's tails and and uh, they just they do it for the sheer joy of it but there is also the education factor involved and it does seem too that play somehow it it, it can flatten the social hierarchy temporarily because you talk about how you know lakota was the omega Kamats was the alpha, their brothers, um, and Lakota would instigate play, and Kamats would play with uh, Lakota, but he would let Lakota win, which was interesting because Lakota's the Omega. Yeah, but, you know, the re- role reversals, and, and uh, where Lakota, the Omega, would actually chase the, the alpha, and the uh, alpha would just um, let him catch him, and it was just... It was really touching to see. So you have to think about this. So that that wolf, the alpha, must have perceived what he meant to his brother to let him do that. So the perception of of just being the leader, but also being a friend, um, I th- I thought that was really touching. Yeah, it's, I think it's very similar to humans in rough housing. You know, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they pass on on uh, knowledge. That this is something that a wolf pack they they learn certain techniques. Um, in Alaska, there was a pack of wolves that specialized in feeding on dow sheep on a, on a mountain face, and if they climbed up the cliffs of the mountain to try to get to the sheep, well, the sheep would just climb higher and get out of the way. But they learned a technique of going around the backside. <laughs> 
and coming down from above. And they were very successful at doing this. But sadly, there's, uh, if the wolves wander out of the national parks, they get trapped and hunted. And the, these wolves um, lost their alphas. And the younger wolves never learned how to hunt sheep that way. So this culture of learning was broken up. Yeah. So these, these wolves never went back to hunting doll sheep that way. It was and, quite sad. And, and we have hunting here in Idaho and Wyoming and Montana, and they hunt wolves, and they break up packs. And when you break up a pack, you know, a good size pack would be a, maybe a dozen wolves. And if you start hunting them and, you know, the – the younger ones are usually the ones that get shot, but also the the leaders. They stand up to the perceived danger. And if you kill this knowledge, then the, the, the wolves that are left are broken up into smaller packs of twos and threes. And they're traumatically um, affected by this. And they they are desperate for food. And so they go after what is easy. And that's sometimes um, livestock. So hunting wolves actually makes it worse for ranchers. Hmm. So, I mean, and I think you also highlighted a story too, where there was a pack that had developed a culture of, I mean, we call it culture. It's kind of what it is. Yeah. Passing it on a culture of hunting mm-hmm. bison together as a team. I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then they, yeah. they killed the older wolves and then that culture stopped. They stopped hunting bison. Right. Same thing. Yeah. It, like in, in Yellowstone Pat- National Park, you know, bison, it, it, it's very specialized. Most of the, uh, the wolf packs hunt uh, deer and elk. And, but there was one pack that really had honed its skills at, at hunting bison. They were much bigger pack and uh, they really worked as a team to bring them down. And, you know, losing that, that culture, that knowledge really uh, devastates the family. And I think this is, again, the wisdom of wolves. Like, there's a role for elderly people, right? The elderly people in our own communities. Yes. Because they have knowledge that's vital that can help, uh, you know, a family or a community thrive. Yes, that's uh, very true. There's a, there's a, a gal, Kara Cassidy, who's been doing research in, in Yellowstone, and uh, she works with us. And she had – she was studying – the effect of older wolves on packs, on, on their packs. And it turns out that a wolf pack is two and a half times more successful when older wolves are in the pack than not. So you can have a smaller pack with older wolves and then a larger pack with no older wolves and the smaller pack with older wolves will do better. And that's because these wolves, as in human culture, they're the carriers of the knowledge. They're the carriers of the history. They know where to cross the rivers. If they get into a dispute with another pack over, let's say, territory, those older wolves have probably come across the other wolves before. So they know the strategies. They know what works and what doesn't work. They may not take place in in the actual dispute or the, the disagreement, the argument, the fighting, but but they're the ones that really guide the younger wolves on on how to uh, how to act and how to conduct themselves. It's it's really important. And you know, it's in today's culture we tend to marginalize our, our elders, and when we really have so much to learn from them. So uh, a wolf howling at the moon is sort of like this archetypal image. Um, <laughs> and you all filmed these, and they don't just do it alone; like they do it in unison which I think is interesting. Yeah. Like, do they know, like, do bilers know why wolves just howl at the, just howl together in unison? Oh gosh. You know, I, I did all the sound recording and I like to say that wolves howl for more reasons than we will ever know. You know, they, they howl when they, when they're just happy, when they feel good, they'll howl after a meal, they'll howl to search for each other. There's a thing called a pack, a pack rally where generally the alpha will start howling and then all the other wolves will come in and, and it's this big kind of jazzy, soulful, uh, hysterical howl. And, uh, and you know, then just all of a sudden it'll, it, it'll start break into play and then it'll die off. And so it, you know, it, it really serves a, a huge purpose. Wolves will also howl by themselves, kind of, we find like to, to check in on each other. You, in the middle of the night, you might get one wolf that'll howl and it's almost like he's saying, hey, I'm here. 
I'm fine. And then another wolf will howl off in the distance and it's like, okay, I'm over here. So it's, uh, it's pretty spectacular, but their, their array of communication is so varied that we've got howls, growls, whines, barks, these sounds that I like to call Chewbacca sounds because it sounds actually like the, uh, the Star Wars, Star Wars character, Chewbacca, kind of a, 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 a it's, it's really, it's really a lot of fun. <laughs> The way we had our camp set up, we were living in their territory, and we uh, built a platform for a yurt and had a wall tent, but we circled the whole thing with chain link. And so when we go to sleep at night, our heads on, on our cots were very close to the canvas wall, which was close to the chain link. And so, and there was a wolf that always liked to hang out there. And he, uh, Wahats would have his little bed right there. And I don't know, during the day, he seemed to be a little bit shy and aloof. But uh, at night, maybe our muffled sound and reminded him of being bottle fed as a youngster. But he would just stay right there. And the, the other wolves would start to howl off in the distance. And he would howl and just launch us out of bed. It was such a surprise in the middle of the night. Right. So, I mean, it sounds like howling, it's sort of a social thing, right? It's sort of, yeah. sort of like how we sing together. I think, I think they've done studies on humans. Like when you sing together with other people, it does all this like stuff to your brain. It makes you feel good, connected, et cetera. Yeah, it, it really does. And, and you know, I, there's a story in the book where we talk about we were doing a presentation at a, a school in Connecticut and as we walked into the auditorium and we took the stage, in unison, all the kids got up. 600 and, 600 and started howling at us. And we found out later that this was not planned. They all just did it. And, uh, you know, you could just tell what a great time they were having howling. Just it was so social. And it took it took a bit to uh, to get them calmed down. But it, you could tell that they loved it just as much as wolves do. Right, right. So maybe the tip, like, howl tonight with your family. Exactly. <laughs> before, yeah. before you go to bed. Or at least sing a song together. Yeah. We can do that. I, I know you all didn't film this, or maybe maybe you did and it just wasn't in the book, but like, do we know what happens when a wolf pack encounters another wolf pack? Is there a conflict? Do they kind of mediate that conflict somehow? Do we know what goes on there? Well, um, we've we've not filmed it, but uh, it's been observed in uh, in Yellowstone, and a lot of different things can happen, and it depends upon the circumstances. If you have, you know, sometimes wolves will try to avoid each other in each other's territory, but there's times when when wolves will have to move through another wolf's territory, and uh, if they come upon the uh, the other pack, then there can be a, a pretty big dispute, a pretty big fight. But you have to realize a lot of these packs in Yellowstone, they follow the car- uh, the um, elk out of the park and they get killed. They, and so they, they have to sort of stay in the park or they run the gauntlet of um, hunters outside the park. And, and they're pretty effective. Yeah. So there's, you know, uh, so they do cross through each other's territory quite a bit. You know, it's not often that, that, that there are serious problems, but there can be conflicts, you know, and that's really not unlike early, you know, human cultures. Yeah. I I thought one of the interesting points you highlight too was that unlike other animal species where say a wolf pack will take out all the adults, they won't do that to the pups and they'll actually adopt the pups. Uh, Because that's interesting because like, I think gorillas, like if they kill, they'll, they'll just kill all the baby gorillas and then lions do the same, adult or male lions do the same thing to lion cubs. Yeah. Yeah, and I think chimpanzees, and and it's it's really interesting. I mean, you know, certainly, you know, a young wolf or a pup could get caught up in the dispute, and something could happen. But but generally, if uh, if if a, one wolf pack takes over another pack after a dispute, they will not kill the pups. Those pups are immediately taken into the family. And if you have a pregnant female, she'll give birth and those pups are immediately taken in. It's, it's really a very, a, a very culturally unique thing that I, that I, that I think we share, you know, yeah. we, uh, we, we adopt other people, you know, other offspring and, and, uh, it's, it's a really, uh, moving thing to see. That's why, why wolves and or dogs or canines yeah. and humans get along so well. Some exactly. Are crazy. The other super fascinating sort of tidbit in the book you guys highlight was uh, the relationship between wolves and ravens. 
Oh, yeah. What, what was going on there? What, what happens between these two? <laughs> well, the, the Ravens would, would sort of tease certain members of the pack and fly real close or hop along the ground and come up behind them and pull their tails. But Ravens and wolves, they, they, they need each other symbolically. In, in the wild, often ravens will lead wolves to a winter kill. And, and they'll do this probably for a selfish reason because they can't open the kill with their beaks. And the wolves can. So they, 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 they benefit from each other. Yeah. So, you know, wolves will follow ravens to uh, a winter kill and, and ravens will follow wolves on, on their hunt. And there's always, you know, little bits and scraps left over. And it was really, you know, fun to see the, the ravens around us. They were scared to death of us. We could never get close to them, but they would hang out with the wolves and, as Jim said, would pull their tails and try to get them to play. And the wolves would sort of haphazardly snap at them and not really caring very much until they got irritated and walked away. But they uh, it was really as if the, the ravens were just kind of instigating some play, like, come get me, come get me. It was it was really great to see. But there was one time where we found a dead raven and it probably was killed by the wolf. And Jamie picked it up and kind of tossed it toward the wolves. And, and the reaction was strange because they, they would normally kill, uh, if they killed a, a bird or a rabbit. brown rabbit, something like that, they would, they would consume it or play with it and then eat it. But this, they, when Jamie threw the carcass to uh, Matsi, the uh, beta wolf, he kind of looked at it like so sad and walked away. Yeah. It's like, it's like it was a mistake. Yeah, like a, tra- a tragic mistake. Right. That was really, it's, I thought that was really interesting and funny too. Like the idea of the picture of a raven picking up a, a wolf's tail. I don't know. I thought it was funny. So what happened to the Sawtooth Pack? You were filming them for from 1991 to 1996. What happened to them after that? Well, we moved them to the Nest Purse Reservation. Uh, our permits were the Forest Service in the area that we lived in under the Sawtooth Mountains, about an hour from our home here. That permit expired. And we renewed it as many times as we could, but we eventually had to find a permanent home. So they, we moved them up to Winchester, Idaho to the Nesperse Reservation, and they lived out their lives there. Um, one of them lived to be about 17 years old. Yeah. yeah. So they were in a, in a similar situation because the one thing, you know, we could not let them go free. They lost the one thing they needed to survive in the wild, which, of course, was fear of humans. But that was, you know, never the plan. We'd sort of hoped that by the time we the sawtooth pack no longer existed that there wouldn't be a need for captive packs anymore so you know they lived out their their lives as as ambassadors there i'd like to mention one thing one sort of a breakout moment for me in the project came in the very first year of the project when we had a, a another omega a black female that we called mataki and um she would take and go off by herself because she could get picked on all the time. So she just would be by herself someplace in the territory. And a mountain lion spotted her and climbed the fence and killed her. But what was so amazing and changed me is when I watched how the wolves reacted to her death. They they stopped playing. They, they you know, as we've talked about playing, it happens all the time. We didn't see play for six weeks. They and they were very affected by being in the area where we found the carcass of this wolf, and we found fur way up in a tree, and claw marks of a cougar up up in the tree. But at the base of the tree, we found claw marks of the wolves, like they tried to chase this lion up the tree, and and then anyway, I guess she escaped somehow. But they also howled differently. They, they, as we talked about pack rallies, they would gather together and celebrate the solidarity of their pack. And um, they stopped howling that way. They would howl separately and look, and their howls were very searching, as if they were trying to call Mataki back. And she, you know, when they would walk through the area where she'd been killed, you know, their heads would go down, their ears would go back. They were, you know, they were clearly visibly upset. They were, they were. You know, the only way to say it is that they were clearly mourning. They, right. they clearly missed her and um, and were grieving her loss. And, and we've heard stories like this of wolves and like of, in Alaska, uh, there, there was a, a famous pair that was being researched by Gordon Haber. 
And uh, the, the female, the alpha female, stepped in a trap. And the pack and the, his her mate um, stayed in the vicinity for a couple of weeks. And these traps don't kill the wolves. So they just linger there until they starve to death or perhaps a hunter comes along and finishes the job. But the, the hunter finally showed up two weeks later. The wolf was still alive. He shot the wolf. And the alpha male ran back into the park, and it was still winter, and he went back to the den site. And he dug up the den and cleared it all out for a litter that he would never father. And then after he finished that, he ran back again to the trapping site. And when Gordon left him, he was howling on a ridge over and over in the direction of the trapping site. Mm. So he was totally confused right. with what happened to his mate. Yeah, that's really sad. When, when did the, the last of the wolves die of the sawtooth pack? Uh, I think it was 14, 2014. 2000, not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We got like, the ripe old age of 17. Yeah, I think we got 98,000 emails. <laughs> we have a nonprofit organization that we, we try to educate people about wolves, and people got to know about this wolf, Payep, and uh, so many stories. And um, it was re- very touching. Well, Jim and Jamie, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and the rest of your work? Well, thanks, Brett. We Yeah, we invite everybody to, to visit our website, livingwithwolves.org. There you can find a lot of information and you know about wolves and our, and, uh, our nonprofit. We're also, Living With Wolves is also on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we also, we just put out a, uh, an interactive exhibit on our website, which is a great educational tool for adults and kids to navigate and learn more about wolves. Fantastic. Well, Jim and Jamie Dutcher, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Brett. My guests today were Jim and Jamie Dutcher. They're the author of the book, The Wisdom of Wolves, available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find out more information about their work at livingwithwolves.org and check out our show notes at aom.is slash wisdomofwolves, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.